Greetings, this is Doc Ock coming at you live and direct from Black Facts Headquarters Central this afternoon. Yes, we are here in the noon time for your listening pleasure. Hope you had a good night and did everything just right because we're about to go ahead and take flight. First things first, as you know, we always like to ask you, remind you, if you haven't already, go ahead and give us a like. If you gave us a like, get on your trike and go ahead and give us a thumbs up if you're looking on YouTube. And then pass the word, let it be heard far and wide from left to right, east to west, north to south, up and down the land. All about this band we got over here because we got a one-man band going and we call it Black Facts. Doc Ock at noon and nine, bringing you the facts about the blacks. Today, let's see what we got here for a proverb. Let's see, let's see. What are they going to give me? Okay. Ah, here we go. A partner in the business will not put an obstacle to it. A partner in the business will not put an obstacle to it. So, this one is all about taking care of business. Every day, taking care of business. Every way. And that is a proverb from the land of Ethiopia, land of our forefathers, the land of our forefathers. That's where I'm from. All right. And continuing on with our book of the day, which is Malcolm X. That's right. The autobiography of Malcolm X. And as promised, we're going to be adding more and more imagery as we go along. We're up to almost 1,000 images so far, but of course, we don't show them all to you at once. We show you a few now and a few later, but we're we're piecing together a visual tapestry, a visual tapestry to go along with our audio rapistry. That's right. So get ready to ride because we riding hard and fast, coming down on you with both barrels aimed right at you. Bringing you something here that'll keep you from be feeling so blue. When you realize that we, not only have we already been here already, but we didn't already come up with the solution to all this pollution. We just haven't enacted it yet. So, Let's see what we got here. This is Malcolm taking over um, the shoe shine stand of a an associate of his new best friend, Shorty. And Shorty happens to be from Lansing, Michigan, just like Malcolm. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, okay. So, this one, uh, it had, um, he's down at the Roseland Ballroom. That's where the, the shoe shine stand is at. And he had heard some customers say that Benny Goodman had discovered, uh, excuse me, Mrs. Benny Goodman had discovered Peggy Lee. And Peggy Lee was on the stage right then. So she finishes up her song and the crowd burst into applause because she was a big hit. So what they did down there at Roseland Ballroom, although we were in, he was in Boston, Massachusetts, which was not a Southern city. It was segregated yet and still. And the way they did it is the same way they did it down South. They had, most nights were for, ever, were for white folks. And then they had a night, you know, like they call it nigger night, when 
the, the, the spooks could come out, the splibs, the, you know, because every other night was for the O phase. Oh, yeah, that's right. We're going into some other language, too. You better break out with a dictionary because you're going to need, you might even need a Pictionary so you can see a picture of what it is that I'm talking about just to keep up. So it knocked me out, too. When I first broke in here, Freddie said, grinning, when I went back in there. But look, you ever shine any shoes? He laughed when I said I hadn't accepted my own. Well, let's get to work. I never had neither. Freddie got on the stand and went to work on his own shoes. Brush, liquid polish, brush, paste wax, shine rag, lacquer, soul dressing, step by step. Freddie showed me just what to do. But you got to get a whole lot faster. You can't waste time because ain't nobody got time to be standing around here waiting on you to get your act together. Okay? And if you want a tip, you know you got you to gotta go faster. Freddie showed me how fast on my own shoes. Then, because business was tapering off, he had time to give me a demo of how to make the shine rag pop like a firecracker. You know, you get on there and you start whacking that thing, popping it once and twice. Oh, because they love to hear that rag pop because they figure that means you really getting down. You can't waste time, he says again. Okay? Dig the action, he asked. He did it in slow motion. I got down and tried it on his shoes. I had the principle of it. Just got to do it faster, Freddie said. It's a jive noise, that's all. Cats tip better. They figure you're knocking yourself out when they hear that the sound of that snap. By the end of the dance, Freddie had let me shine the shoes of two or three, I mean, three or four stray drunks. He talked into having shines. And I had practiced picking up my speed on Freddie's shoes until they looked like mirrors. You could see his face in them. After we had helped the janitors to clean up the ballroom, uh, after the to clean up the ballroom after the dance, throwing out all the paper and cigarette butts and empty liquor bottles, Freddie was nice enough to drive me all the way home to Ella's on the hill in the secondhand maroon Buick. He said he was going to trade in on his Cadillac. He talked to me all the way. I guess it's all right if I tell you. Pick up a couple of dozen packs of rubbers, two bits a piece. You know that some of those cats that came up to me around the end of the dance, well, when some have new chicks going right, they'll come asking you for a rubber. Charge a dollar. Generally, you'll get an extra tip. He looked across at me. Some hustles you're too new for. Cats will ask you for liquor. Some will want reefers. But you don't need to have nothing except rubbers until you can dig who's a cop. Because you definitely want to be digging on that. You don't want to be selling nothing like that to no daggone cops. You can make $10, $12 a dance for yourself if you work everything right, Freddie said, before I got out of the car in front of Ellis. The main thing you got to remember is that everything in the world is a hustle. So long, Red. The next time I ran into Freddie, I was downtown one night a few weeks later. He was parked in his pearl gray Cadillac, sharp as a tack, cooling it. You know that's right. Man, you sure schooled me, I said. And he laughed. He knew what I meant. I had It hadn't taken me long on the job to find out that Freddie had done less shoe shining and tile hustling than selling liquor and reefers and putting white johns in touch with Negro whores. Mm-hmm. That's right. The hose was out. Yeah. Uh, I also learned that white girls always flocked to the Negro dances. Some, um, some of them whores whose pimps brought them to mixed business and pleasure. Others who came with their black boyfriends and some who came in alone for a little freelance lusting among a plentiful availability of enthusiastic Negro men. 
at the white dancers, of course, nothing black was allowed. And that's where the black whores pimps soon showed a new shoe shine boy what he could pick up on the side by slipping a phone number or address to the white Johns who came around to the end of the dance looking for black chicks. You got any, you got any black chicks? We looking for, looking for a good time. Maybe y'all, y'all might know where to find some, some black chicks. Right. Most of Roseland's dancers were for whites only. And they had white bands only. But the only white band ever to play there at a Negro dance, to my recollection, was Charlie Barnett's. The fact is that very few white bands could have satisfied the Negro dancers. But I know that Charlie Barnett's Cherokee and his red skin rumba drove those Negroes wild. They'd jam pack that ballroom. The black girls in way out silk and satin dresses and shoes, their hair done in all kinds of styles. The men sharp in their zoot suits and crazy conks. And everybody grinning and greased and gassed. Some of the bandsmen would come up to the man, the men's room at about eight o'clock and get shoe shines before they went to work. Duke Ellington, Count Basie, Lionel Hampton, Cootie Williams, all of them wore shoes. You know, that's right. Come on now. All right. Uh, Jimmy Lunsford were just a few of those who sat in my chair. I would really make my shine rag sound like someone had set off Chinese firecrackers. Duke's great sax man, Johnny Hodges, he was Shorty's idol, still owes me for a shoe shine I gave him. He was in the chair one night for a shoe shine I gave him. Um, excuse me. He was in the chair one night having a friendly argument with the drummer, Sonny Greer, who was standing there. When I tapped the bottom of his shoes to signal that I was finished, Hodges stepped down, reaching his hand in his pocket to pay me, but then snatched his hand out to gesture and just forgot me and walked away. I wouldn't have dared to bother him over the 25 cents or whatever it was, the two bits for the for the shoe shine. The, the man who could do what he did with Daydream by asking him for 15 cents, man, that would have been a serious insult. I just let it ride, but I never forgot. I forgave, but I didn't forget. I remember that I struck up a little shoe shine stand conversation with Count Basie's great blues singer, Jimmy Russian. He's the one famous for sent for you yesterday, here you come today, and things like that. Russian's feet, I remember, were big and funny shaped. Not long like most big feet, but they were round and roly poly, just like Russian. Anyhow, he even introduced me to some of the other bassy cats like Lester Young, Harry Edison, Buddy Tate, Don Bias, Dickie Wells, and Buck Clayton. They'd walk in the restroom later by themselves. Hey, Red, they'd be up there in my chair and my shine rag was popping to the beat of all their records spinning in my head. Musicians never have had anywhere a greater shoe shine boy fan than I was. I would write to Wilfred and Hilda and Filbert and Reginald back in Lansing trying to describe it. I never got any decent tips though until the middle of the Negro dances, which is when the dancers started feeling real good. And getting generous. After the white dances, when I helped to clean out the ballroom, we would throw out perhaps a dozen empty liquor bottles. But after the Negro dances, we'd have to throw out cartons full of empty fifth bottles. Not rot gut either, but the best brands and especially scotch. During lulls up there in the men's room, sometimes I'd get in five minutes 
of watching the dancing. The white people dance as though someone had trained them. Left, one, two, right, three, four. The same steps and patterns over and over as though somebody had wound them up. But those Negroes, nobody in the world could have choreographed the way they did whatever they felt. Just grabbing partners, even the white chicks who came to the Negro dances. And my black brethren today may hate me for saying it, but a lot of black girls nearly got run over by some of those Negro males scrambling to get at those white women. You would have thought God had lowered some of his angels. Times have sure changed. If it happened today, those same black girls would go after those Negro men and the... What? Hmm. Anyway, some couples were so abandoned, flinging high and wide. What happened here? Wait, wait a minute. What's going on? I'm losing some bandwidth up in here. Oh, wait a minute. Because I know that picture didn't look like that last time I showed it. Okay. I'm going to back up here a little bit. Had some bandwidth problems here. Um, we're so abandoned, flinging high and wide, improvising steps and movements that you couldn't believe. I could feel the beat in my bones, even though I had never danced. Showtime, people would start hollering about the last hour of the dance. Then a couple of dozen really wild couples would stay on the floor. The girls changing to low white sneakers. The band now would really be blasting and all the other dancers would form a clapping, shouting circle to watch that wild competition as it began, covering only a quarter or so of the ballroom floor. The band, the spectators, and the dancers would be making the Roseland Ballroom feel like a big rocking ship. Oh yeah, that joint was jumping. The spotlight would be turning pink, yellow, green, and blue, picking up the couples, Lindy hopping as if they had gone mad. Well, man, well. People would be shouting at the band, and it would be wailing until first one and then another couple just ran out of strength and stumbled off toward the crowd, exhausted and soaked with sweat. Sometimes I'd be down there standing inside the door, jumping up and down in my gray jacket, with the whisk broom in the pocket. And the manager would have to come and shout at me that I had customers upstairs. I forgot all about why I was really there. The first liquor I drank, my first cigarettes, even my first reefers. I can't specifically remember, but I know they were all mixed together with my first shooting craps, playing cards and betting my dollar a day on the numbers as I started hanging out at night with Shorty and his friends. Shorty's jokes about how country I had been made us all laugh. I still was country. I know now, but it all felt so great because I was accepted. All of us would be in somebody's place. Usually one of the girls and we'd be turning on the reefers, making everybody's head light or the whiskey aglow in our middles. Everybody understood that my head had to stay kinky a little while longer to grow long enough for Shorty to conk it for me. One of those these nights, I remarked that I had saved about half enough to get a zoo. Save? Shorty couldn't believe it. Homeboy, you never heard of credit? He told me he'd call a neighborhood clothing store the first thing in the morning and I should be there early. And that's the end of that. And there you see our last picture of the day with Malcolm with his head conked. What they call it? Fried, died, and laid to the side. Fried, died, and laid to the side. Bad to the bone. You know that dude would never be alone. Once he got that red mop of hair conked properly and had it looking like uh, Charlton Heston's hair or somebody like that. Oh, man, you know, the girls were going crazy over him. Big, tall, light-skinned, red nigga. 
Oh, yeah. You know they loved him. Who? Okay, see, this is almost as bad as reading all those um, Anansi stories from Jamaica. Man, it took me over a month before I could get to talking like a normal person again. Because I just naturally got so deep off into the linguistics. You know, I'm a linguist at heart, just like my daddy. Well, not just like my daddy, but very similar, though. Very similar. We got some traits that run similar. And my daughter, too. I got a daughter that's like that. Well, all of my daughters speak different languages, but some a lot more than others. All right. So we're going to end our show right about now. And um, we'll end it by just reminding you that tonight we will be continuing with the story of the Black Panther Party as told in this brand new 2021 graphic novel. That's right. We got a graphic novel here. You ain't never heard before. You never heard of before. You never seen before. And it's by a couple of unknown, an unknown author and an unknown illustrator. But it has some very fine graphics inside with a lot of detail and a lot of character to it because they actually give you a lot of shading for the for the various people, etc. And they they have a um I think he paid a lot of attention to the, the various skin tones of colors of the, the people's skin, etc., which doesn't always happen. A lot of times people just just paint you black or brown and say, well, that's it. It must, it's got to be right. They said he was black. I just throw black on it and I'm done. So they went out of their way to, to include some detail there, some detailed work. You could tell they really took their time with it. Um, last but not least, let me not make sure, let me make sure to also, um, remind you that there's a few things you need to do as we close out here. Number one, if you haven't already, make sure to give us a like on Facebook. Number two, if you're watching us on the tube, which is where you should be so that you can see all the graphics, otherwise you'll hear the sound, but you'll miss the graphics. And that's half the story right about now. Um, then give us a thumbs up if you're on YouTube. And then last but not least, go ahead and make sure to, um, and make sure to become a sustaining member of the Black Facts family. And we gave you a number of ways to do it. On your phone, go to your notifications. On your, um, go to Facebook notifications. On your, um, on your computer, it, at the bottom of every live stream, you'll see a link. And if you're on the if you're on the computer or the phone, and you see my personal profile picture, which is a good looking picture of me in my younger days, click that automatic uh, link to the donation button. And last but not least, if you're on YouTube, you can always go to our website. The website is on in the description. It's in the description on YouTube. We're leaving that there as a permanent fixture now. Should have done it before. Hadn't figured out exactly how to do it. It finally dawned on me. So, better late than never. We're going to carry on uh, just a little bit longer while we wait to see what y'all going to do. What y'all going to do. And in the meantime, we'll be black tonight at 9 o'clock. This is Doc Ock at noon and 9 signing off. Peace out, y'all. Have a good day. over there, Gabriella Vonderwheel. Peace out to you too.